welcome to episode 18 of season 2 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Friday the 20th of November 2009 and in this episode we're going to hear from Stuart Langridge and Elliot Murphy about the fantastic new Ubuntu music store. We'll cover the latest news and events, then we'll um, have even more from Stuart Langridge, this time with John O'Bacon, uh, talking about their new podcast. And uh, then we'll do the competition, Ecosphere and some feedback. I'm Simon and this week there's three of us again. Yay. Bit of a swap around. The two regulars are here, of course. (laughs) (laughs) Three, it's the magic number. Yeah. (laughs) Come on, what's been going on this week, you two? Laura, go on, you go first. I got a new car. It's very nice. It is. It's all shiny. I got it this afternoon. Is it an open source car? No, but it does do 60 miles to the gallon, I'm told. It looks quite geeky. It's got a sort of nice geeky look to it. It's a bit true. Yeah. C1, is it? C1, yeah. Very nice. Mm. It's all shiny and silver. Excellent. Who's going to be the first to dent it, you or him? I don't think I've ever dented a car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. I'll do it on the way out. Say fine. <laughs> this goes out on Wednesday, so there's five days. <laughs> five days to put that right. I don't think I have. No, not yet. Um, what have you been up to, mate? Uh, uh, very little um, Ubuntu-wise, although I've been using Ubuntu to write some essays. I'm doing a course at the moment, so I'm writing these big essays. And it's quite interesting getting... Um, into open office a bit and, and using some of the more the more advanced features in that learning how to format documents in the same way as all the style guides say but they're all written for word and you're trying to do it with something else right i yeah. thought they're they not going to take open office off ubuntu just leave g edit there <laughs> <laughs> trouble yeah. maker more of that later yeah something like that anyway well, what about you i've um i've been using ubuntu you know i'm a crunch bank uh yeah fan actually I've got a bit tired of not having uh, all the latest crack. <laughs> so uh, I've installed uh, Karmic on a couple of systems, okay, uh, which is going really well. Until? Uh, until I have no sound. Ah. Ah. Yeah, I've had quite a few problems with sound as well. Yeah. On Karmic. People at work have. Yeah. <sighs> Hopefully they'll sort it out in a few few weeks or so. I, I did guess. get asked if I knew anybody who knew about sound on Linux in general. Yeah. And I don't think I do. Does anybody out there know? <laughs> There's a fair bit on... Um, on the wiki and stuff um, about how to diagnose your problem but uh, yeah Yeah. I've had even quite fairly simple things fail like trying to play back a file using Totem just I think if something grabs hold of it and and it grabs hold of the sound device and won't play anything else it seems like that sort of problem but yeah it's I mean some fairly fundamental things not working which is a little bit odd a bit weird well normally I do um, I do a release upgrade so I'll go from an old release to a new release but Mm. I've stopped doing that and I've said this in the past I think it's a really and Popey would fight me to death over this, but that's a really bad way of doing things. Yeah. Um, so these two installs have been fresh to make mm. sure that it all worked. And in fact, both did work just fine, uh, sound-wise and everything else. And then just without an update or anything, the sound just stopped and has not yeah. come back. I've had issues with Nautilus as well, just stopping working. You know, um, if you're looking at a directory on using Nautilus, it yep. previews all the icons. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it just sits there with a little spinning icon, doesn't show you any files in the directory. And mm. it's it's a little bit, I don't know, there just seems to be a few little things on there, a few we little rough edges. A, uh, we should do a fault diagnosis section, we? Yeah. Maybe we should do that next season. Next season, yeah. yeah. So where's um, Tweedledee and Tweedledum then? <laughs> They're um, out in the States, aren't they? Yeah. Deciding oh, yes. what's going to be in Lucid Links. Yep, they're letting Dave and Alan decide. <laughs> Frightening. <laughs> It'll all go wrong. We've well, seen a picture of Davy with a gun. Yeah, that, um, that made me glad <laughs> I was the other side of the Atlantic from that. <laughs> but yeah, they seem to be having a good time. They've sent us a couple of interviews, as Simon said at the beginning. Um, so we're going to play those in. And that's about it. Sounds like a fun pack show. Oh. Okay, I'm here with uh, Stuart Langridge and Elliot Murphy from Canonical, and uh, you both work on the Ubuntu One project. Now, we've talked about Ubuntu One before. Can you just give us uh, the 30-second elevator pitch as to what Ubuntu One is? Well, um, Ubuntu One is bringing uh, cloud services to Ubuntu. Uh, When we started off, we did file synchronization, so you can save files on your local machine, and they'd be synced up to the cloud and then down to your other machines, no problem. Since then, we've gone on to do uh, Tomboy Notes synchronization and contacts from your Evolution Address book, and that was all released for Comic, which came out uh, recently, as I suspect your listeners may know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and today we saw the announcement that there was going to be some extra functionality for Lucid. Yeah, so we're talking about improvements to the services we already had, but the really exciting thing today was uh, announcing a music store. 
where um, in the default music player in Ubuntu, you'll now be able to go um, buy from a very large catalog um, and get that music downloaded right onto your onto your Ubuntu machine. And so by very large catalog, do we mean the kinds of music that people will hear on the radio or are we talking you know weird artists on you know open source websites this is not just a very large catalog of independent art this is major label music exactly the same as other famous computer music stores you may have heard of so you'll be able to from your ubuntu desktop be able to go and get the music that you want to listen to download it and play it and will this be a seamless experience in the applications that we're already used to or will it be a new app or how, how will that be implemented it's the, so it's the app that's already there. Um, Rhythmbox is the default music player. And um, there'll be just, you, s you select the store, you'll see uh, a new tab in Rhythmbox. Uh, you'll be able to browse the catalog and purchase music using your Ubuntu One account. So uh, the only prerequisite really is that you're running an Ubuntu desktop, you've got Rhythmbox, which is in by default, and you've signed up for Ubuntu One. Correct. Right. <laughs> I'm getting this. This is really good. <laughs> I like this. It's really easy. So... Um, Obviously, there's going to be deals struck between uh, Canonical and um, some record labels. And how, how are you implementing the, the buying stuff? Is that going to be you're going to pass us off to some third party to buy stuff? Or is it, is it going to be straight away in the music player? I can just get it straight away? Or how is that going to work? So there'll be phases. We're, we're going to um, partner with someone who specializes in building white label music stores. So there will be an Ubuntu music store. And then um, that will be presented through a browser control in Rhythmbox. That's sort of phase one, what we're talking about doing for Lucid. At some point in the future, um, we'll have access to all of the APIs for that music store, and we'll do an even richer, more seamlessly integrated experience. You won't have to, to do anything crazy in order to get the music downloaded and go, go off to a separate website or something. It'll be integrated right into the player. So you put in your credit card details and buy the tracks you want they'll be downloaded automatically into your music library and what format will those music files come down in mp3s um that sort of thing is largely controlled by the record labels so uh the bit rates of the mp3s vary they tend to go from 320 uh is it kilobits yeah <laughs> all the way down to 128 or something but uh they'll come down as mp3s and out of the box obviously i can't play mp3 so are you dealing with some magic that's going to make that work or am i going to use the existing features that automatically get codecs or whatever so for now uh, we're not changing that experience at all uh, it will work exactly the same way it does today in karmic uh, where gstreamer prompts you for getting some codecs onto your machine the first time you play one of those um one of those mp3s or other types of files this is just about providing a very easy conduit for you to actually buy music on your Ubuntu machine. So once I've once I've downloaded my music and I can play it in Rhythmbox, once I've got the codex and that's a one-time thing and yeah, most users will do that, I, I guess. Um, most, most users, I would say, would already have them, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a user who's already using Ubuntu, yes, yes uh, that, yeah, fair point. Um, but a new user, brand new experience, they've never seen this before, obviously they're going to yeah. sign up. But, yeah, you're right, they probably already have. <laughs> um, how do they then get that to... Is, is it going to be seamless that they can get that music once they've downloaded it onto their music player, whatever that might be? We think we might need a file syncing sort of service kind of thing to make that happen. We have one of those in Karmic. Um, in Karmic, uh, it only syncs the Ubuntu One folder in your home directory. Um, one of the other things that we're doing in Lucid is to allow users to select, oh, I'd like these other folders in my home directory to be synced also. So you'll be able to very easily say, please sync my music folder, and that will sync around to all your machines. I don't think we've mentioned it so far, This these MP3s will have no DRM. It's totally okay for you to play them on your other computers as well, and Ubuntu One will make it very easy to put those, not only back them up to the cloud, but make them available on all your laptops. And will there be limitations on numbers of machines you can copy them across to? No, no, so that you're purchasing the music, you own the music, and it's for you to use on your machines, but there's no no sort of DRM that's counting how many laptops you put it on or anything like that. So if I've got oodles of machines and they all run Ubuntu One and I choose to share my music folder uh, with Ubuntu One file sync service and 
they just magically appear on all my machines and everything's happy and no federal law agency or you know no. copyright people are going to come knocking on my door and tell me I'm using too many copies of my music. Right. And of course nobody has machines that don't run Ubuntu, but if someone <laughs> if someone theoretically did, they could then go to the Ubuntu One website and download their their songs right from the the web interface that that has all their files. Will that mean I could download the songs I've already bought? So if I've if I've gone through the the Rhythmbox interface and downloaded an album and then I'm at my parents' house and I want to listen to music while I'm using their computer. Could I go to the store in the browser and re-download and play it there? So you won't go to the store and re-download from the store. They only uh, give you one or two downloads and then cut you off. It's, it's, it's very much like purchasing at a real store. You, that you, there's a transaction and you get the item. But I, I think everyone will, will want to just synchronize those with Ubuntu One to have them backed up. And you will be able to go to the Ubuntu One website and download them as, as many times as you want. Oh, sorry, I misunderstood. So I can go to my synchronized files that are yeah. on Ubuntu One. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. That makes total sense. So as well as um, music, what about um, other types of media like audio books or movies? Is any of that being considered for this cycle? So we, we want to do other types of media as well. But for Lucid, for this cycle, it's just music. Um, we're still exploring how to get TV shows and, and audio books and other, other things in. This is, this is just the first step. And what about other players? I know Rhythmbox is the default, but a lot of people, you know, choice is a great thing on Linux. And a lot of people choose different players like Banshee and Amarok and so on. Will there be scope to make the functionality work in those other players as well? Well, our implementation is going to be, first of all, relatively simple, and secondly, uh, relatively easy to port to other players because what we're actually doing is exposing a, a basically a web browser control with a certain amount of cleverness around it to handle downloads and so on. It won't be very difficult for someone to look at how that works and then port that to uh, an alternative media player, Banshee or Amarok or what have you. And part of what we're going to be doing is exposing the APIs that we're using and the documentation for those APIs from the partner, whoever that is, so other people can look at that and then build their own players that go through the Ubuntu One, go to the Ubuntu One music store. So today in, in uh, one of the sessions we were <clears> talking <throat> with um, someone from KDE about making sure that we do this in a way that's as easy as possible to integrate into the KDE music player and other music players that people might want to do. So what we're committing to deliver is something in Rhythmbox, but we're trying to make it very, very easy for other people to, to um, pick up and do work and integrate into other music players. And in terms of the development work you're doing, how much of it is free and open software and how much of it is closed stuff behind closed doors? Absolutely everything we're building is open source. Um, the the music store itself provided by the, whichever partner we choose that itself probably won't be open in the same way that you know Google isn't mm -hmm. <laughs> but what we're building is entirely open source built on documented APIs and everyone will have the source start looking at it um, so if this is in scope for for Lucid are you already making tentative plans for what's coming up in MM whatever that release might be called so we've got some plans. There's there's certainly been no shortage of ideas here at UDS <laughs> um, from people who have been using Ubuntu One and are coming to us with really cool ideas for how to integrate into other applications. At lunch today, we had a really interesting discussion with someone from the Myth Ubuntu project talking about how to use Ubuntu One to back up um, Myth TV configuration files. And there's people talking about um, cool things that they're going to do with Gwibber and, and Desktop Couch, part of Ubuntu One. So... Um, it's it's obviously way too early to say what will be an MM, but there's been tons of cool ideas coming out here at the conference. And when can we expect to see um, early versions of uh, the music store in Lucid? I guess somewhere in the alpha beta stage. Early in the alphas, yeah. We're so we're still trying to get the paperwork signed with a with a partner, but um, it's relatively simple work, and we want to put it into the the first alphas. Yeah, we want to get it out as early as possible, cause, so people can start looking at it, working with it, playing with it. So, will there be any kind of um, referral system or um, means that I can uh, not just for the music store but for Ubuntu One I know other online services have the ability to um, refer my friend and if I give my friend an invite code or something like that then I could um, you know, get a kickback for that and it also perpetuates the users of the, of the system 
Yeah, so we wanted to invite codes or rewards or something like that at, at some point. Um, not just yet. We've been very pleased with how many people are signing up for Ubuntu One. It's, it's, been, it's been really nice to see the reaction. And so we don't need to do anything right now to try and get more people on the system. We're, we've still got a, a good bit of work to do with scaling the servers up and making it handle the load. Sometime in the next year, we'll probably do something with invite codes, but we don't have anything planned like that right now. Speaking of server load, I've, I've seen some discussion online and some issues relating to capacity or what seem like maybe capacity problems. Are you aware of any issues at the moment with, with capacity for Ubuntu One, or is it, do you think it's working okay and a few teething problems, or how, does, how, is, how is the perception of how that's working? So we've, we've had a big spike since the Carmack release. A uh, number of users has tripled to what we had before mm. it was released. And um, we've installed a bunch of new servers and brought up new EC2 machines, and I think we're, we're coping with it pretty well. As we introduce like bigger and bigger server pools and load balancers to different parts of the system, it's natural to discover bottlenecks in the back end. So one of the things that is a big, big focus for Lucid, we talked about the music store, and that's a really cool new feature. Over half my team is reserved and set aside just for dealing with quality of service, making sure that we run the thing that's highly available and that is is there you know there's there's been times when a server went down for a few minutes or we've we've had to figure out why isn't why aren't the load balancers picking things up properly and so those back end server improvements aren't something that's super sexy and that we can like convince people to buy because because we're doing them but if we don't do them then people will be disappointed because the service will just not feel reliable and they'll go away so we're putting a lot of effort into making sure that it that it is there and reliable and and working fast and dealing with the, the, the load of users. Are you, would you consider um, for this Lucid cycle, given this is a new feature and you're asking people to spend money in order to test this feature, some kind of system whereby people can download free music or download cheap music or maybe you allow, pay for us to download it because we're going to be testing something that, that every time we test it, we're generating revenue for you. So we haven't we haven't talked about that specifically, but I think that we should clearly do something where the hosts of podcasts get free music. <laughs> I like that. That's a good answer, and that's competent enough for me. <laughs> As do I, actually. <laughs> hmm, okay, that's uncomfortable. <laughs> yes. Hmm, okay. Um, is there anything else? Is there anything else you wanted to say that's interesting or innovative about uh, Ubuntu One? So I'm I'm more than anything else, excited about um, the work we've done with Desktop Couch, which is a very simple um, storage system that applications on the desktop can make use of, whether or not they want to have anything to do with Ubuntu One. If their users um, sign up for Ubuntu One, that application is then sort of magically cloud-enabled. I think that's really cool. And we've just now started talking with, with uh, various upstream app developers about it. and so. I want to put an invitation out there for anybody who works on an application. If you're interested in learning how you could make your application really seamlessly, with very little work on your part, sync across to different people's machines, sync up to the cloud and do, do online backups and all that kind of stuff, come and talk to us on, on hash Ubuntu One in Freenode or on the Ubuntu One users mailing list, and we'll be happy to help you hook your app up into it. It's dead simple. It's like 10 lines of code. Yeah. Um, to give an example, we uh, I was chatting today with a notable upstream who you will have heard of who decided to port his application from its current storage mechanism over to using desktop couch for everything and it took him 20 minutes and he didn't even need to read the documentation he just poked around the thing ran PyDoc a couple of times and then moved it over and that was it done he was hugely impressed which I was quite gratified by obviously <laughs> and and he came to say well I had no idea it would be that easy. I thought it would be really quite complicated. And was kind of, yeah, that's what the message we're trying to get across to people, that this stuff, it really is easy. And if, and if it's not easy, come and talk to us and we'll make it easy. You know, if it's not easy, it's clearly my fault and I should fix it. So come and talk to us. Yeah, so one of, one of our goals is that the coolest apps using Ubuntu One should not be written by us. So right now, of course, we're getting a lot of attention because we're the ones who are initially writing some things that use these services. But the really exciting story is that these are there for other people to use too. Cool. Thanks very much, guys. First, there will be news, and then there will be events. News. 
Some Fedora 12 users have been horrified to learn that users can install software without root privileges by default. Only applications signed by the Fedora project can be installed, but some people are calling this a major security flaw. Yeah, there was a big argument about this on the Fedora bug tracker. Really kicked off. Hmm. I think it was basically that they weren't happy about people can choose to just install their own um, their own applications. Yeah, but they are signed. Yeah. I hadn't read the sign bit before, so... But that assumes that all the processes that go behind the Fedora repository and maintaining that and making sure the applications are secure uh, are up to scratch as well. There's a whole heap of debate about it. It is an issue, but maybe we are just being a little over the top with the security. Maybe. I think there's an argument to say that you know trusted users could be able to install stuff that's signed without root privileges. You know, you should be able to assign a group of people you might want to be able to do that. But you know, in a corporation, for example, you want to be able to audit what what people are installing and make sure they're not installing something that will you know breach all your various corporate rules and regulations. I know Fedora is not aimed at that. At, at that market at the moment but what goes into Fedora eventually makes its way into Red Hat and therefore into the enterprise um, but apparently they have just had a big um, a big blog post and a, and a mailing list discussion about it and they're going to reverse that move it was new in Fedora 12 which came out like a week ago and they're already going to decide the power to power of the community good stuff pedal yeah wow. The distinctly not evil Google have announced a preview of their Chrome operating system. The open source preview essentially puts the Chrome browser on top of Linux, though it won't be possible to run other applications. I haven't looked at this, but I don't quite get it. What don't you get? Why would you bother installing something that's just a browser? Well, Google are putting everything out on the cloud, so you won't have anything on your laptop. It'll just have something that can run a browser and everything will be out there. And the idea is that it yeah, runs on a netbook yeah. um, or other portable device. And, and, you know, you don't need a big, powerful computer. You can have something that uses next to no processing power and next to no storage. So you have solid state storage and a small one at that. And uh, save, save save power, get longer battery life out of things. I think it's going to be a, a good thing I for think... computing in general, actually, because it's going to, in theory, give computing to those that don't necessarily don't want to get into the guts of it and can't cope with, oh, it doesn't work, what do I do? It's, and, oh, sorry, Laura. it's good in theory, but it doesn't allow you to have other applications running. I'm sure, not... I'm sure there's got to be a way around it. I'm sure somebody will work out a way. But there's a lot of people don't, don't want other applications. They just want something to, as, as we said, you know, something to play a bit of music, mm. surf the net, do a bit of um, word processing, and that's about it. Till their internet connection goes down. Well, that is the issue. Mm. And I've, you know, we're quite spoiled in this country. I, mean, I went to the States last year and, you know, everything was done on the cloud here. And I went to the States and there was no Wi-Fi, no hotel, and I wasn't going to pay for the data rates. Yeah. And I had nothing apart yeah. from, you know, the little box of wizardry, which did uh, nothing. And yeah. I was, yeah, I was thinking we weren't that spoiled here either. It's quite <laughs> unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this house in particular. This house in particular. But, but Canonical have also announced that they're contributing developers to Google to work on this project. So that's quite interesting. Hopefully it'll integrate nicely with Ubuntu services as well. Microsoft have withdrawn a tool for loading Windows 7 onto a USB stick after it was found to have incorporated GPL code. The program, developed by a third party, will now be uh, re-released with the necessary source code available. Yeah, good move, Microsoft. Well done. They put their hands up to it quite quickly and said, yeah, okay, we'll sort this out. That's good to see. And the, the, the open source project was hosted on CodePlex, which is Microsoft's open source software hosting service. So there's a little bit of an irony there. <laughs> I just imagine whoever the subcontractor is has got their wrist slaps quite significantly. But yeah, um, yeah no, good. it was a good response and they did the right thing. Droid Camp is on Tuesday the 1st of December from 9.30 in the morning at The Crypt in St. James's Church, Clerkenwell. Clerkenwell? Yeah, one Clapham of those. One, uh, in London, and it's free to go. Do you know what it is? I have no idea. It's Droid Camp, you know, as in Android? Android, yeah. As in the mobile operating system, or? Yeah, indeed. Okay, oh, right, I was yeah. thinking robots. Yeah, like Robot Wars. <laughs> well, the thing that follows on the day after, on the 2nd of December, is Droid Con. Um, uh-huh. In a different location, it's actually at the Skills Matter Exchange, which is uh, in Gospel Road in London, uh, and that's not free. It's... Uh, that's quite significantly not free. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it looks like a good event um, mm. if you're into that sort of stuff. Certainly if I um, was out of contract and could a- afford an Android phone, I might actually go along because I'm very interested. Well, I would um, 
I would suggest that on the droid camp on the Tuesday, you build robots that can then force their way in, <laughs> all lasers blazing, to droid con on the following day yeah. and get in for free. I think it's robots. Yeah, that's my mind. I'll put some links on the uh, on the show notes to the uh, websites. And if somebody goes, they can tell us which was right. Bosswatch are holding two workshops on Monday the 7th of December in Oxford, one on open source, open development, open innovation, and the other one on building an engaged community. We'll put a link in the show notes, but I know Mark Johnson um, from Hampshire Lug is talking at least one of those. All these events during the week. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? And finally, FOSDEM uh, in February 6th and 7th uh, next year in the University Libre Brussels. And we'll see you there, hopefully. This is Dave and me here at um, UDS with Jono and uh, Stuart, Jono Bacon and Stuart Language, who some of our listeners might have heard they did a little podcast some time ago <laughs> <laughs> called Lug Radio. And um, yeah. yeah, so you've got a new podcast coming up. Well, tell us all about it. We have. Uh, it's called Shot of Jack. And the basic story of it was um, when we finished doing Lug Radio, um, went for about three months, I think it was. And uh, I called him up one day and I said, kind of miss doing lug radio but we decided withdrawal symptoms yeah well we decided it was the right time to stop doing lug radio we felt like we'd you know we'd reached the end of the mile and um, yeah but there, there comes a point in every week where you think oh I must talk about that on the show and then you think oh we haven't got a we show we haven't got a show <laughs> <laughs> disappointing so it, started, it must really let you down <laughs> it started out as like phone calls and, and you know he'd answer the phone he'd go hello welcome to lug radio it would be a bit weird <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so then yeah and then we basically um, about probably about three four months ago we were we, all, we, all, we had the idea of doing something and we put it on ice because we got really busy I'd moved to the US he was busy with work I was busy with work and um, independently we were thinking you know wouldn't it be cool to do like a new thing well, this is great. and I was at Oscon uh, and I got talking to a couple of people there Elam Rabinovich who does Scale and Dave Neary from Gnome with peg under his arm <laughs> and, that, and uh, they said why is there no more like radio and, and I said, you know, I gave the whole thing about you. We thought it was the right time and so on. And they said, well, it'd be really interesting if you did something kind of different. And this idea started forming in my head about doing something not that wasn't Lug like Radio again, something a lot more punchy and short. Yeah. And, and then I, I, I spoke to John about it, and he basically independently came up with exactly the same idea. So we thought this is clearly fake. Yeah. I'm, so the, th- the thing we found about it was the fact that, like, Lug like Radio was very long. It was like, yeah. At first, it was, you know, half an hour, an hour, and then it turned into sometimes like a two-hour marathon. <laughs> and uh, we wanted to make something... Re- That's the reason why it's called Shot of Jack, is that it's no longer than ten minutes. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a different formula in terms of how it works. Yeah. Each show is an independent shot, ten minutes long, on one specific subject. We won't ramble too much. <laughs> so what kind of subjects are you going to cover? <clears throat> it's, it's still um, open source... It's the same subjects that we'd cover in Lug Radio. It's open source and stuff that interests us, technology. So it's not just going to be Linux. It's not just going to be um, free culture stuff. The idea is that we'll talk about... So, for example, we're, you know, we're going to have one on, on Twitter and ARM as well. You know, these are relevant, but... Subjects that people like us are interested in, basically. Yes. So is it an opinion-based thing or a news thing or... Oh, so it's Ooh, a bit of both, really. It's a combination of the two. One of the, one of the real drivers we had for it is that we wanted it to be rather better research than Lug Radio. People would occasionally... Any, it won't be hard, will it? Any <laughs> research is better research. People would occasionally say, not without a grain of truth in it, that we would, we would not research Lug Radio incredibly well. And, <laughs> and, and, they were uh, right, yeah. Yeah, and something we tried to do uh, quite differently for Shot of Jack is pick one subject and actually know about it beforehand yeah. so the, the discussion's a lot more uh, concentrated, a lot more relevant. So it's, we, we, we have an analogy in terms, like when we started doing Log Radio it was always, we wanted to make Top Gear the goal was, we wanted to make something like Top Gear which was, it's about Top Gear is about cars so, but, so, anyone who lives outside of England probably is less familiar with Top Gear but Top Gear was a show about it was a motoring show and it started out really boring and then it turned into this really fun show where they did stupid things with cars. And we wanted to do that for Lug Radio. We wanted it to be fun, but also relevant to the demographic that it's targeted towards. Whereas with Shot of Jack, in my mind, and I think it's the same with, with yeah. Ack as well, is the daily show. 
<coughs> that's what we're going what, for. What the overall vibe, the mise en scène of the show. Get you. I oh, know, isn't it good? You were um, down on a cereal pack. The o- <laughs> you got back, <laughs> back of a matchbook. The overall mise en scène of the show. Someone's going to write in and say he's not using the word mise en scène correctly now. Yeah, we have but, those kind of listeners. <laughs> <laughs> the, o- the overall vibe of the show is much is, is the day of the show. You know, um, short, punchy, satirical, well informed. Yeah. So okay. So it can't. Be, you can't be expected to be uh, like an authority on subjects about everything you wish to talk about. So I mean, how how, Speak how for is yourself? <laughs> yourself <pal. laughs> but, okay. Okay. So so can you tell me about the register registrar registers on an ARM processor and things like that? I mean, it's it's not that deep. I mean, so using that as an example, you know that that show that shot which we've already recorded is 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 basically talking about a ARM. There's a lot of hype around ARM. Is it worth it? Now, in Log Radio, what we do is we'd sit there and we'd ramble on about it for about 15 minutes with absolutely no research or justification. Just basically some opinion that we'd pulled out of our ass. Uh, you're going to have to beep that, aren't you? Um, <laughs> I was not, being really careful. Um, <laughs> um, the problem is, is that no one's going to know what you beeped. <laughs> it wasn't... It was a very... Okay. Not nice. <laughs> anyway, it, no, it wasn't... Ah, anyway... Moving on. Um, so uh, it's all in the edit. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Simon. <laughs> so with uh, with Lug Radio, you know, we'd pull it out of the air, right? And uh, with with shot of Jack, what we we'd actually do research. So um, we work together, and we go and find research, and we put it together, and we reference the research in the show as well. We're, we're still going to lean to some extent towards the social aspects of technology. We're not, we're not going to be talking about ARM registers or yeah. how to recompile your kernel or anything, but. The, the notion of whether recompiling your kernel is important in this day, like day and age is more yeah. our metier. Yeah, I mean, the point, the point I was really leaning towards is will the show format consistently just be you two or do you think you'll, we might have like a, a, an, an external authority getting involved? Answer unclear, try again later. We've, yeah. <laughs> so right now it's going to be the two of us. We've, again, drawn from the Daily Show analogy, the thing that I'm quite keen to do, we've talked about, but this isn't planned for a while yet, is having the idea of correspondence. So on the Daily Show, they've got like these four or five comedians who are regularly on there, and they all have comedy like correspondence. Like they have like the senior black correspondent and the senior English correspondent, whatever else. And you know that kind of thing is always on the Daily Show. And uh, we we like the idea of having like regular people who come on to Shot of Jack and maybe talk about something. Because the structure of the show is, you know, we read a monologue, we write a monologue, which is... So you, you, you're prescripting... <clears throat> how much of it are you prescripting? Like the, the first minute. Yeah. <clears throat> well, what, what we do is that, um, to introduce the topic, um, summarise current developments, the way the world is, and then pose a question for discussion, that bit is prescripted. And then the rest of it is not prescripted. Now, one of the things about Lug Radio that, that I think helped it, helped the, the whole dynamic of the show was the fact that you were four guys sat in... Jono's bedroom recording locally um, now Jono's based in San Francisco and you're based in England so how, how are you going to record and how are you going to like bring that together and, and keep that similar kind of dynamic well we were worried about that to be honest with you that was but, the reason why we were always put off from doing stuff yeah, but we actually sat down and tried the voiceover over <coughs> stuff and it, it, it's surprising how much we can get back into the mindset of sitting in a room. And if we both hold a cup of tea, even if we're not in the same room, it feels rather inclusive still. You have to squash up really tight in your own house. <laughs> like, you feel like you're in Jono's bedroom. Put some socks, you're washing, yeah. hanging around. I, I have to go and stand outside my own back garden to have a cigarette and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so how often are these episodes going to come out and when does it start? Twice or- a week. Wow. It's, yeah, it's, it, there's going to be two episodes a week, and they don't take long to record, of course, you know, because they're only ten minutes. Um, they don't require a lot of editing. It's just one take. So we basically sit down and we, uh, you know, we just we, we, we prepare for each show. So we write we write the opening script um, for each episode, and then we then we just switch it on. And we've only we've only, we've done a couple so far just to prep. But yeah, um, first show comes out on <coughs> the next, next week. That so, we, so when this episode comes out, it probably will already be out. Yes. The first episode. If this, yeah, our first show comes out Tuesday next week. So which is the twenty something? Yeah, right of November. So one thing that really interests me is the it's the name. I mean, how did that come about? I mean, who who is Jack? That's Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we were, he's right, but it's still Bacon's idea. <laughs> trying to think of a name, right? Because it's it's short and it's snappy, and we didn't want it to be. It was absolutely not going to be Lug Radio, obviously, because it's not Lug Radio. Um, <clears throat> so we're like sitting around one day, and I said, you know, it's, it's John O'Nack, right? 
and, and then I just was just writing it down and it said Jack okay. and then I was thinking Jack and then shot of Jack see, yeah, see of these things always come across much better when you have to explain them <laughs> <laughs> See, that's yeah. the reason why it's spelt in kind of like a French-looking yeah, way. J- J-A-Q kind of so, thing. You know, and, and then, you know, because they're the individual shots, you've got the whole idea of trying to drive discussion from each individual episode. Yeah. And uh, what tools do you use for recording and editing? I assume you're using Jacosha. Ha! <laughs> uh. <laughs> so what we're doing is we took the proprietary and log radio and we dialed it up a notch. <laughs> so, so, so what we're doing is we're, we're recording... The way it works is we have... Um, because we're obviously in separate countries, we're using Skype, which is about the best thing you can use to have a conversation. And then we record each microphone feed locally. Um, so we're not actually recording Skype. <laughs> just using it as a medium That's for okay. communication. Yeah. It's a sync. <laughs> just so we can hear each other and see each other because we have the video yeah. switched on. Um, and then the first show that we, the, the trial run that we did, we, uh, uh, we actually did it in Jakosha, and it all worked perfectly. The problem that we had was that um, the compression, like as we talked about at Odd Camp, the compression was not, it's just not as good. So for now, we're going to do it on, on Cubase, um, just so we can get the quality, because I don't want to sacrifice the quality for the person. So tools. Ak just records his WAV file, compresses uh, it, and sends it over to and you, what and he does, you edit them together. Yeah, so we record, what we do is we, we record the show, so what we do is we have some notes as well while we're recording the show that we both look at while we're recording, and then we finish recording the show, he then has a OG file, or a WAV yeah, file. Which, we, uh, we, we, whichever one is, I forget. Whichever, whatever, that. and then he basically dumps it into Ubuntu 1. And then um, it appears in my desktop. Into a shared folder. And then I grab it from Ubuntu One. We should do that. And, and, then, yeah. and then Jono copies it onto a USB key and then walks over to his Mac, which, you, which yeah. is, I, I admit, the last, you know, the last hurdle in the process. But so oh, there should be an Ubuntu One client for the Mac, really, uh, shouldn't there? Uh, if someone wants to write one, I'm all about well, uh, helping people deploy Mac's it. not plugged in. Mac's so, not plugged uh, into the network. It's about, but the thing that impressed us both was that, with the exception of the audio compression stuff, Jakosha worked. Perfectly. Yeah. Without a hitch. It didn't crash, it didn't wow. fall out. What a, it and, also, and you, and you so can write deployment re- scripts. the actual Jokosha have you? No, it Artists. works. So, where can people get it? And are you on iTunes and Twitter and all that kind of malarkey? How can people yeah. find out more? Shotofjack.org. J-A-Q. Shotofjack.org. Um, is where it will be. The cool thing about it as well is that when you go there, we'll release a show. You'll be able to listen to it from your web browser. And instead of people leaving, like the, the most fun thing about Lug Radio was hearing what people thought afterwards. People he rabidly disagreed with us in most cases. So what happened with, with that, we, we asked them to go to the forum. So instead of doing that, you know, we were thinking, well, people should really just post comments on a blog entry. So each, each, each entry on the website is a new episode. And they can just go there, listen to it, and then leave comments. Um, and then we have like a Twitter feed as well, Shot of Jack. We have an identical feed, Shot of Jack. Um, as for iTunes, we haven't hit that across um, yeah, that bridge yet. So. Yeah, yeah, I need to sort it out. You can't submit it until you've got an episode on Twitter. It helps yeah. to have, you know, content. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I need to find someone who's got iTunes to actually help me out with it. So. So yes. The thing I'm really looking forward to, not so much the content, but the jingle. Because, I mean, you had a pretty good jingle going on with Lug Radio. Yeah, well, a bit of pressure on that, you know. Because <laughs> I just wrote that song, you know, for my nephew and didn't think anything of it. And then, of course, it... It became world famous. And then, it, you know, it was on Lug Radio. So I stood there in my studio thinking, what am I going to write now? With a bass guitar, worried. <laughs> and I knocked something up. And, of course, everyone's going to hate it at first if anyone likes Lug Radio. But I think it's, it's got some groove to it. I'm quite happy with it. And uh, yeah, well, all the best, and uh, we'll catch up with you when you've churned out five thousand episodes in a couple of years, and, <laughs> and do shot of Jack live. Uh. <laughs> Can you imagine basically the whole world jumping into Wolverhampton for a ten-minute episode? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it's going to be somewhere, it's not going to be Wolverhampton. <laughs> Thanks, well, guys. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Cheers. And time for the competition. Uh, we have an Ubuntu Oggio laptop bag that Peter Callan kindly donated to us after winning it in the raffle at Og Camp. And decidedly not wanting it. <laughs> <laughs> Is he a Fedora man? Uh, no, he's Arch Linux, I think. Oh. He, he's, he's not really an Ubuntu fan, it's fair, no. to be say. okay. fair to say. So we asked the question, how many presenters were on stage for the Og Camp live show? And um, we got lots of um, entries. And the winner is James Tate who said there were six presenters on stage for the Ock Camp live show. From memory, left to right, Laura, Dan, Poppy, Fab, Simon and Tony. 
Davey was, of course, absent due to some other wishy-washy release commitments. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like uh, James was actually there. It does, doesn't it? Well, Which is extra good. Yeah, well done. yeah. He's unlucky he's not not to won it in the raffle in the first place. <laughs> and saved everybody a lot of hassle. Yeah. <laughs> <Some chance. laughs> yeah. Um, oh, well, congratulations, James. Yeah, congratulations. And there may be a slight delay in getting it to you because Alan's in the US at the minute at UDS. Yeah, and it's at his house. Still no Alan in this episode, so it's time for the bit about Ubuntu, what we have <laughs> renamed the Ecosphere to. Um, and the first story coming up is... At UDS this week, a decision has been made to remove the GIMP from the default installation of Ubuntu. Mm. The photo editor will still be available through add remove programs, but it was felt it was too complex for the average user. Yeah, this has got some people quite cross and a lot of people are going, yeah, that sounds like a reasonable idea. There's, there's a few few reasons for it, I think, that they've given. One is that it takes up a lot of disk space. Yeah. And I don't know, you could fit in does several it really? applications. I yeah, don't know how I, much it yeah, I believe it does. Right. Um, and they really don't want to get over DVD, so mm. uh, fair. it does make sense. It's still there. I think with the, with the software, what's it called now? The Ubuntu Software Store. Center, is it Store? That's it. Ubuntu Software Store. It's quite easy to find applications. So if you want something more meaty, then you just go there, click and, and go, and it's done. Yeah, I think their argument is that it's a, a professional level application, and that if you want it, you can go and install it fairly straightforward, fairly fairly easily. Um, but for the majority of users who just want something more simple, they can use the editing features in FSpot, which is there by default anyway. Mm. So historically, Ubuntu's always had FSpot and the GIMP anyway. I think it's a great idea. I think the GIMP's really off-putting if this is your first sort of experience of Ubuntu and that's the graphics package that you find. Mm. You talked about this in the live show, didn't you? Old camp. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what caused it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I can. I, people are saying, oh, the F spot isn't a proper photo editor. But I think for the majority of people who aren't into doing like hugely cr- creative photography or anything, it's it's great. You can do red eye correction, you can crop, you can tweak the contrast and the color balance and stuff, um, and you can um, yeah do multiple revisions of the same same image so you don't lose the original. I guess most of the people that are complaining and, and moaning are actually power users or developers who are into this sort of stuff anyway. So yeah. 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 And at which point you go, app get install GIMP. <laughs> How hard is or, that? Or use the yeah. graphic equivalent thereof. <laughs> and and problem solved. You know, you wait five minutes while it downloads and, and it installs and off it goes. The the final argument that, that I heard them make was um that I heard it being made as a justification for it was through this blog post. Um was that Windows doesn't have a photo editing app by default, so why should Ubuntu? And that's the only one that I that I disagree with. Yeah. Um because I think uh, we should be trying to be better than what Windows does. Yeah, we also, shouldn't base ourselves on on what that does. Yeah. We're not restricted by monopoly legal legalities. Yeah, exactly. And you know, uh, Windows doesn't have an Office suite by default, but but we do. Yeah. Well, Windows would have all those things by default if they were allowed to. Yeah, true. Next up, the Ubuntu high avail- high availability server team have announced they're going to experiment with Keep Alive D and IPv Sadam. <laughs> whoever he is as well as working out uh, working with more with the upstream communities i guess this is something really if you're into the uh, servers and you run clusters on ubuntu and stuff um, this is probably going to be of interest to you um, but it's good to see that they're uh, they're still supporting the old red hat heartbeat tools which allows two servers to monitor the status of each other and yep. one to take over if, if the, the primary one fails but yeah good to see that they're, they're making some progress on that i wonder if there are any really big ubuntu clusters out there have you heard of any no no if you, I was quite surprised, actually. I, look, I read into this this afternoon, so I had an idea as to what it was all about, and um, I was quite surprised that, that this was going on. I didn't realise that we, or we uh, Ubuntu is getting into the cloud and, and clusters at such a level. Obviously, they are. Yeah, and I think was it the UDS in um, Mountain View in last December now, um, a year ago, I guess, wow, um, they, they were looking at um, integrating the, the early cloud technologies using some of the Google compatible APIs and stuff. We well, just asked if they're using any cloud technology. Well, Ubuntu One is all well, cloud, so absolutely. obviously um, they're supporting themselves with that. Yeah, and I know that Ubuntu use cloud servers for distribution day and things. They have a whole lot of extra cloud stuff that fires up and allows people to get the ISOs and download yeah. the packages. The Spanish Loco have released the first episode of their new podcast. Yes, I had a quick listen to the beginning of it. Um, it sounds really good, actually. It's a nice rock music in there. What's the quality like? Yeah, it's pretty good, pretty good. I don't know what they're recording on or anything. Um, and It'd be nice to see um, how big the audience gets. I think it's always a big yeah. concern that you put in so much effort and nobody listens. 
Yeah. 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 I don't know how big the loco is in, in Spain, but I, I know that there are quite a lot of Linux using areas in Spain because they've got the Extreme Madura region, which rolled out Linux to all their schools. So I should imagine there's probably quite a few, uh, quite a few Ubuntu I, users out there. I guess it'll appeal to just Spanish-speaking people as well, not just the Spanish loco. Yeah, it'll be a, the Spanish language is quite extensive, well, really, isn't it? Like extensively yeah. used. So. Yeah. But I don't know who they're aiming at. I don't know whether they're aiming at existing Ubuntu users or whether it's an advocacy tool. But yeah, good luck to them. Uh, Dustin Kirkland's been uh, busy again uh, with a new package um, system called uh, Test Drive. Apparently, uh, Popey's uh, chatted to us on IRC whilst he's out in UDS. You uh, basically run Test Drive. It grabs the ISO uh, and then boots it into a KVM. So you can grab the latest Lucid, boot it up into a KVM and have a test. All in one easy command or something, I guess. essentially test driving Lucid rather than um, destroying your nice install and, and losing things. I like that idea. It sounds like like a very good way to sort of no oh, to give it a go to test it out and yeah, to yeah. Uh, and the fact that it, I think it only downloads the diffs between um, ISOs. Once you've got the the full ISO, it only downloads the diffs. I think so. Subsequent releases should be only small downloads for you to get, test it and keep up to date. I wonder if there's any um, automatic um, feedback within Test Drive, or is it just a case of you filing bugs as and when you find them? Uh, automated feedback would be great, wouldn't it? I mean, one of the things we talked about before is that you know using the development version, if you're if it breaks on your machine and and therefore you can't do your work, so you don't run it or you run it on a separate machine, that's sort of work to maintain. But being able to do that and just fo- easily click and file yeah. a bug about something yeah. you find would be fantastic. You could even like attach a screenshot or something and send it off with yeah. the bug report. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And that's all we've got in the bit about Ubuntu this time. Time for some feedback. And Ron wrote an email to tell us in detail about his woes upgrading to Karmic and suggested three things which should be different about upgrades. The first thing, a clear report either as text or a web file on what was turned off or shut down and not reactivated or had its configura- configuration file uh, replaced. Secondly, a roadmap of links back to the Ubuntu forums or wiki on how to turn on items such as restricted extras, either the stuff that everyone uses but can't be included for license reasons. And thirdly, a roadmap of where important files live. He says, I still don't know where the plugins for Firefox live in uh, 910. If you search the entire disk drive, there are four places that have Firefox slash plugins subdirectories. Uh, do the words redundant, overkill, poor design, poor execution come to mind? Yeah, well, Ron was not backwards about going forwards with that one. Um, I, I actually really agree with the uh, report about what got turned on, what, what had its configuration file overwritten and all that sort of stuff. Um, I know when I've done upgrades from the console and servers before, it's been, you, you get prompted to these things as you go through, yeah, but it's sure. really useful to be able to look at them afterwards and go back and tweak anything and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, it would be very handy. I always used to make notes in Tomboy or something as I was doing it, but yeah. uh, uh, it would be handy to have it automated. Siste commented on the blog. It's just a fact that other Linux distributions do this updating part better than Ubuntu. Canonical only has 200 employees, and I assume only a fraction of them are actually doing QA and downstream development. The question is why. What Ubuntu is doing, essentially, is making the users guinea pigs because there's simply no way that so few employees can actually QA test on so many hardware configurations and such. Ubuntu is supposed to be for human beings, right? Well, human beings aren't guinea pigs. Unless they want to be. I yeah. mean, it's part of the whole big community thing, isn't it? Is that everybody gets in there and tests and files bugs. It's, yeah, it's not just about canonical employees. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in fact, what Soren has to say is also relevant to that. What I'd like to see is for LTS releases to be public releases and all the other ones to be sort of development releases. Of course, people still want to be running the latest, but that's usually related to user applications. So if we could get more backports for the LTS versions, especially for uh, the more popular software, that would uh, probably satisfy most of the users. As Laura said, nowadays there's not that much to look forward to from one release to another. So why bother? Now, that's quite interesting because one of the things we had in the last episode was a comment that actually everything other than LTS releases are, in a way, development releases. Mm. And I think I'm right in saying that if you've installed a, a, an LTS release, a long-term service release, it won't tell you to upgrade to the next development release. That's right. You have to, you have to you know, manually say, look, show me the development releases, show me the interim releases. So it is, in fact, saying that you know everything other than LTS is, is interim, is development. It'll have weird new stuff in it that won't necessarily work quite as intended. <laughs> 
Can you upgrade directly from one LCS to another? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there have only been two so far, and mm. that, that has been possible, yeah. Um, and I assume it's going to be possible for the next one as well. Um, but the backports idea that Soren's talking about is, is quite interesting. Yeah. I mean, there are backports package, pa- packages that are backported into older releases, but mm. not a huge amount of activity there, I think. It's really only where there's sort of a really good uh, security reason or something for doing it. But how, do, how does Canonical find out what's needed? Obviously, we're all heavily into Ubuntu and mm. therefore we always want the latest crack. So they need to get hold of users and just try and find out what they're after. I know that my my family, my extended family, actually, they're not really interested in up, upgrading. They just want it to work and they're happy. And in fact, a lot of the time they don't want me to upgrade because it just works, leave it alone. Yeah. And that's fine for most people. Yeah. It's- yeah, so maybe the backports idea would work. Yeah, I mean, it used to be when you had things like OpenOffice and Firefox were going through their earlier stages and their earlier release numbers, that there were quite big changes between some of those releases. And if you had 0.6, there were probably a shed loads of bugs in 0.7, say, that were fixed and that it was worth upgrading to. But when you're on reasonably stable releases of, of like OpenOffice 3 or Firefox 3, there are security fixes, fixes, but there's maybe no real compelling reason to go to the next you know, major release of those of those distros. When you know, if you have to wait a year or two anyway, I think this is where um, you know Google Chrome OS actually will come into its own. Yeah, because people, you know, those level of that level of user is just not interested in upgrading. Mm. They just want it to work, and therefore, you know, if it's all cloud based, then it will just work. Mm. I still think that every they they're all missing the sort of section of business users who actually want a decent laptop set up but it's got to be stable Mm. and they don't want or can't spend the time uh, maintaining it themselves but they still want a decent setup and that's where the lts releases come in you think no i don't think the lts is is up to date enough for that that's my point i think it needs to be a yearly one um i don't think i think the the difference between a development release that's not lts and an lts release is too big right um i think it needs to be more upstairs but more but keeping the stability so with the, with the whole thing that soren's suggesting of backports you're backporting key applications to a, a, a more stable uh, lts base say uh, answer that need yeah possibly oh there you go soren you've got cottoned onto something there yeah <laughs> you might have solved all of our problems Laura Kacheska sent us an email, helped and aided by Poppy. It goes, potato, bejesus, begora. <laughs> You're not going to try and do the accent? No, okay. I can't do accents, mate. Anybody? No way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I could, but I've met Laura. Yeah. Um, she's after a new section called Command Line Hate. Uh, <laughs> uh, to go with my Command Line Love. Mm. Um, that would be good. Uh, it would consist of command lines you must not use, such as RM... Uh, dash RF slash and uh, fork bombs. Ah, uh, fork bombs. Yes, Davey's, well, Pope's <laughs> favourite weapon of choice, yeah. uh, especially with Davey. Um, yeah, we could have a think about that. Yeah, well, I'll, th- I'll try to think of other things other than just something that would delete all of your hard, hard uh, all of your files, sorry, from your hard disk. What else would you hate on the command line? Have, to have a think of that. Send your suggestions in if you've got them, listeners. Send them in to uh, the usual address. I've had some, uh, some feedback via Twitter and Identica. Our motters. I said, first time listener since OCCAMP version of Linux Outlaws. Excellent podcast. The European podcasts are definitely a lot better than the US ones. Why, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> we, we try. And uh, good to know that the uh, some people are hearing us or heard us on the OCCAMP episode uh, and uh, come in to listen to us as well. Crossover listeners. Yeah, I wonder <laughs> if uh, Dan and Fab have had anybody who started to listen to their show since our episode from OCCAMP. I do hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Bless. Talking to Linux Outlaws, uh, Fab... Uh, sent us a message saying excel is a fantastic framework quote from a uupc interview yeah that was in the interview from anna i think only fab really commented on it at least to us yeah i did think we might get more comments on that yeah but you know that was that's fair enough she had her reasons for saying it (laughs) yamat said i like the sound of the fireworks in the background of that uupc it made me think that they were sitting around a fire with marshmallows (laughs) we were yeah We we did was it Last season, we did a, a, a whole episode out in the garden. Yeah, we, we? did, yeah. That was good yeah. fun. It was completely pitch black by the time we finished. <laughs> it was, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. We should do that again. You have to wait for the summer, really. You do. Yeah. But that was good fun, as long as it doesn't rain. It nearly rained, I remember. It did nearly <laughs> rain, yeah. Meast P on Twitter said... 
Og Camp 10 uh, would be an appropriate name, obviously 2010, and sufficiently geeky with 10 being binary for two. Ooh, Ooh I, I quite guess. like that. <laughs> yeah, although it's a bit like those annoying t-shirts that say there are 10 types of people in the world. Hey, I had that t-shirt. <laughs> Did you? That's a brilliant t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. So many people would stop me and say, that doesn't make any sense. And then every now and then somebody go, oh, nice t-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> I think I've seen it on too many people, to be honest. I'm sure it looks great on you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Jamie Ross, 1991, said... Okay, just started using Karmic for the first time. It's gorgeous. It's tempting me away from windows. Wow. Excellent. That's what we like to, like to see. It, it does look really nice. I think it's probably one of the nicer looking releases we've seen recently. With, with I know everybody goes on about the boot screen, but that looks quite nice. And yeah, I like the way that... Now apparently, um, Jaunty had this as well, but the notification thing, when you hover over it, it goes blurry, like it's gone out of focus. You found that tonight, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I love that. That's great. <laughs> it's my favourite thing about... to get help. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that as well. Um, but yeah, so, well, thank you for all your, your feedback. It's great to have it. Um, <laughs> we would like to say that, as much as we appreciate all this feedback, if you can um, make your point in about 100 words or so, if you're sending us an email, it um, makes it much more likely we'll include your comment because um, big, long, thousand-word rants are uh, a bit tough to extract the core, the core sentiments from. Um, so yes, yeah, so please try and keep it to the point, but we do appreciate all your feedback and the time you take in to write into us. Thank you. That's the end of the show, so thank you for listening and thank you to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. If you'd like to get hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can leave us a voicemail in a number of ways, telephone 0845 508 1986 or avoid podcast at sip.ubuntu-uk.org. And finally, you could Skype us at Ubuntu UK Podcast. You can send us your comments and get updates from recording sessions on Identica or Twitter where we are at UUPC. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash ubuntu-uk-podcast channel on the Freenode IRC network. Join our Facebook fan page. Search for Ubuntu UK Podcast. Of course, we welcome just a moment. Come online loves, reviews or rants and feedback, both positive and negative, so please do get in touch. And finally, thank you to our network of community mirrors listed on the website. That's all for this time. We'll be back next time with more interviews from UDS. And hopefully more presenters. (laughs) See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.